Greetings, Langarinos. Welcome to episode five of the Lango Pod podcast. I am your host, Peter. I'm a resident linguist at Lango. I have a background in syntax, phonology, and language conservation, special attention to the Pacific. I'm Lisa. I teach the Korean programs at Lango, and I'm a sociolinguist. I study the social aspects of language variation and change. I'm Tyler. I'm the Marie Kondo of Lango. And <laughs> That's true. Teach, uh, I'm teaching Chinese, Japanese, and English here at the, uh, these days at the moment. And my particular interest is in how languages change through time. That sparks joy, Tyler. It does. Well, and so does our bookshelf of language learning materials because yeah, of that. All right, so today we are going to uh, set your phrases to stun because today we're studying phrase structure for the language learner. So uh, I guess we'll start with what even is a phrase? So the phrase is a syntactic unit, right? Syntax being the arrangement of elements in a sentence or an utterance. So you need to recall from uh, episode four, the idea, the notion of the morpheme. So morphemes are used to create words and words create phrases. I wanna leave you with some phrase intuition before we get into the nitty gritty too much. Uh, and that is from a teacher all three of us shared, Hadge Ross, who said, he wrote it on the board of class when I was studying with him, OCM, only chunks move, right? So one of the ways you can test certain types of phrases is if they move as a unit. Keep this in mind uh, and look for it as we go through our discussion of phrases and syntax. Let's yeah. re briefly recapitulate what a morpheme is just in one example. So a word like cat, an English word, referring to the animal, that has just one morpheme. We can't cut it into any smaller meaningful parts. Whereas the plural form, cats, that has two morphemes, two meaningful pieces into which the word can be segmented. And the two pieces are cat and the plural marker, S, in this case. Very appropriate example. It always comes to mind. <laughs> More information on cats, dogs, and judges, please check out our most recent blog post, which is accompanies episode number four. All right, so we talked about using morphemes to build words but I skipped a level here and never told you what a word was. I know that if you uh, have thought about it as a listener and a speaker of a language or a signer of a language, then you have an intuition what a word is, but it is a bit of a slippery concept. In linguistics, there are two, two basic ways to define the word. The first way is through phonological definition. So we can call this one any word defined by its phonology, we'll call it the, phon the phonological word. Phonology, in case you don't recall, has to do with the sounds of a word, physical manifestation of speech. Right, so phonology distinguished from phonetics would be, of course, the, the psychological element. What is a sound in your mind, even though they realize a bit differently, right? So one of the things we notice when we look at words, it's not, it's not always easy to tell from language to language, but most languages will give you some clue at some level that sounds change a bit differently when they're touching inside a word than when they are touching between words, right? And we're going to talk about this more at the end of the podcast. We're going to give you a little game to play to see if you can see how you know what the phonological word is in English. Now, the second way to define a word is through syntax. So the syntactic word is a slightly less clear notion Right? It's somewhere between the phonological word and the phrase. And that's about, about as much as I'm going to say, let's say it moves as a syntactic unit, uh, smaller than the phrase, bigger than the morpheme. That's not super helpful, uh, but you can imagine there's a myriad of syntactic definitions then, right? So uh, jumping back right quick, we want to look at some sound changes that are different within words than between words. In English, uh, we have a thing that we call juncture phenomena, which is that things, it's exactly like this. Things tend to change a little bit differently between words than within words, but we can create sequences of words that look like, right, in some way a single word. And it's kind of, I think it's a fun way to type text messages, for example. So our first example is 
spatial, as in spatial awareness, versus space eel, eel, a fish which is in space, right? So spatial, uh, when these sounds touch, the when these sounds you mean the e in spatial uh -huh. touches the t or nominally s sound, mm -hmm. it becomes a sh sound. But space eel does not become spatial because the E is touching the S. No, it seems to have the same sounds involved, right? It seems to have the same sounds involved. An our next example is maybe a little bit more clear. We're going to have a couple examples <laughs> till you get the idea. And but let's just look at the point, the main point briefly. We often use this hashtag symbol to represent a word boundary. So the fact that a sound change happened in one case but not the other, we're saying lets us hear that there is a word boundary in the second case, space eel. The same for um, electricity and electric itty, as in itty bitty, something really tiny. So Because <laughs> itty on its own. <laughs> itty is nothing on its own as far as I know. Not yet. Um, not yet, but if you don't want to waste your whole life saying itty bitty every time, <laughs> just say itty. <laughs> so we, what is spelled with a C mm -hmm. in electricity is pronounced with an S in electricity and with a K in electric. Right? So this K sound, we can assume electric re represents the underlying sound, only changes to an S sound right? when what is attached to it is part of the same word. Okay. Now this is called velar, soften velar softening, I believe is the name of this phenomena. And I don't know how much it's a real... English phenomena versus one that is just inherited from Latin. But to a modern speaker with no knowledge of the history of the language, uh, this will certainly tell you the difference between electricity and electric itty. And so while the first and our spatial space eel example, while there we have different letters, different words in that, no, actually just different letters giving different sequences of sounds. If you weren't convinced mm -hmm. by that, here's a case where we have the same letters. Right. And we have the exact same letters in two different sequences of words in our next example. And the first example, listen carefully, is dogs led, as in dogs led us in singing a song. <laughs> this... <laughs> <laughs> if your syntax examples aren't fun, you're not doing it right. So the second word is dog sled, right? The thing that maybe the dogs are leading is a dog sled. So you could say dogs led a dog sled. Right now, dogs led. There's some big differences there. One of the biggest one is this S because it's a part of the word dog is pronounced as a Z. Right. Voice. So we have this uh, thing we discussed in the last podcast and in the last blog where um, this kind of S when it attaches to something, it will be voiceless if it's following a voiceless sound and voiced if it's following a voiced sound. But this doesn't happen between words. So we don't get dog sled for dog sled. In fact, that may even sound like the other word. Our next example, um, fair play to reigning cats and dogs. Our next example is cat zeal, zeal. versus again from space, our cat's eel. So in cat zeal, one who loves cats, let's say, might have a lot of cat zeal. <laughs> zeal is kind of a fervor. In case you're not a native speaker of English, zeal is kind of like an excitement or fervor for something. I'm sure fervor didn't help things. Um, but cat zeal, for example, Tyler loves cats. You might say he's full of cat zeal, right? But cat's eel, as in cats, plural or possessive, and then eel, the kind of fish that looks like a snake. Right, again, the difference between the S and the Z sound tells us where the word boundary is. The next one is an even closer example. We have two proper names in English, Pat and Rick. Or the if first I, word could be the verb. What did you do to Rick? I patted him. That's right. I, or it could be a command, Pat Rick, right? So like maybe Rick is feeling down, needs a pat on the back or whatever. So Pat Rick, those are two separate words. But when you put it together, the T changes quite a bit to Pat Trick. Mm -hmm. In my English, anyways, that T becomes kind of like a CH sound. Mm -hmm. We would call it palatalized in uh, linguistics. So I get Pat Trick 
for when it's one word and Pat Rick when it's two words. Right. So speakers of our dialect or dialects always distinguish these two cases. These will never sound alike for me. For me, they will always sound different too. So maybe it won't work for all varieties of world English, but we're hoping one of these uh, examples works for you if you're a native speaker and the idea clicks. Yes, there's a difference between uh, word boundaries and what happens within a word. Our next uh, example. Here again, why are we going through all these? <laughs> yes, the point is so that so the point is so that we have some notion of what a phonological word is, an intuitive notion. There are cases where we can tell there's a word boundary here because of the application or lack of application of the rule. That's right. And our next one, because we're obsessed with Rick, is <laughs> elect Rick versus electric. Again, it's the same kind Very of sound similar. change. Yeah, the same kind of thing. Um, and our final, uh, well, we have a, it's a close contested mm -hmm. election. And so <laughs> some people might argue elect Ron versus electron. And again, the same way the T sounds uh, change when they're at the end of the word versus when they're touching something at the word boundary. Yeah. There's also a syllable break, right? That also helps you. Uh, so again, what we're talking about in these second cases, in both these examples, electric, electron, because of the where the syllable boundary falls, mm -hmm. the T gets this much juicier sound, ch, rather than a nice dry T in elect. <laughs> Same with Patrick and Patrick. So all, all three of those are focusing on a different angles on the same sound change. Now, our last one uh, is one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. If you grew up in school in probably, I guess, where I did in around North Texas area, you probably had many students in your class named Chris. And one of the most common things is if someone has a common name, of course, you say the first letter of their last name. Uh, this is culturally part of my culture. I don't know how big it goes in America, but we have now a distinction between crispy, uh, as in toast that has been very well cooked, versus Chris P, one of the Chris's in your class whose last name begins with a P. So crispy versus Chris P is two different, uh, two totally different things. And you can tell because the word boundary. Um, Oot, my mom just called me, sorry. We're gonna have to uh, stop. Oh, pause. So our final example on uh, looking at sounds and word boundaries is crispy versus your classmate named Chris with the last name that begins with P, Chris P, right? So you can tell the difference between these uh, two sequences, crispy, and Chris P. In fact, crispy could be a descriptor of Chris P, perhaps. <laughs> um, crispy, crispy, right? That that sounds very similar, though. That's that one sounds uh, more similar, yeah. Yeah, cool. especially when you put it in sequence. But in isolation, they sound pretty different to me. Crispy versus Chris P. Ordinarily, with the initial, the main stress is going to come at the end, Chris P, mm -hmm. and that causes this P sound to aspirate. Aspirate. So more breath coming out when you say Chris P, the final syllable, okay. but then when we say crispy. That's right. And so the stress changes like 13 trumpets and 13 trombones. So, all right. So uh, moving on with phrases, as you may remember, uh, we already told you only chunks move. So a phrase uh, is a constituent, right? A constituent um, is a chunk, right? So in case you didn't know what a constituent was, um, it's a, a whole unit, right? Or in the most technical uh, syntactic theoretical terms, we would say a chunk, right? So I want to give you some constituency tests. Uh, now, Hadge has spoiled this for us. It is OCM, only chunks move. So phrases move together. We're going to look at this in an example sentence, which is Liz ate the licorice flavored pizza. And we want to test the constituency here of the object of eating. So we're going to say the licorice flavored pizza is what Liz ate. Notice that if I don't move the whole chunk, if I move it uh, not at a good chunk boundary, let's say, it's not grammatical anymore. So 
if I were to move part of it, I would get flavored pizza is was, excuse me, flavored pizza is what Liz ate the licorice, right? From Liz ate the licorice flavored pizza. Now flavored pizza is what Liz ate the licorice is ungrammatical. Native speakers, um, first language speakers are not going to like this sort of sentence, right? Showing that the licorice flavored pizza is a chunk. Now you can have chunks within chunks, but you have to, you know, cut them at the right chunk border, let's say. So you can't- and Tyler, take... you've, uh, you've annotated a little yeah, red yeah. outline around our asterisk. For those of you watching, that's one symbol that we use in linguistics to show something is not acceptable for other meanings. Here, it shows that we know this is ill-formed. It won't sound good. In uh, grammatical studies, we use this asterisk to represent ungrammatical forms. So forms that first language speakers um, would find, uh, sorry, do you say form so much, but poorly formed. <laughs> Not felicitous, yeah. Yeah. The crazy thing, and it'll have to be a podcast for another day, is that some things are worse than other things, even when both are bad. So this is, a, again, a hedge point that I think that uh, is a little bit underappreciated. Some things are wronger than others. So I, I had to step out real, really quick, but I just want to make the point, forgive me if it's repetitive, but all phrases are strings of words, but not all strings of words are phrases is what we're showing here. That's right. That's a good summation of, we didn't say that Tyler, but that's a perfect summation of the point of this particular slide. So uh, when we get down to why this matters, right? Uh, what we want to know is why should the language learner learn anything about phrases? Of course, if you are in love with syntax and you're passionate about it, then you need to learn about phrases. But if your goal is just to learn a language, why should you bother to care about it? Well, that's because phrases help you, right? The notion of the phrase scaffolds the learning of particles, affixes, clitics, and modifiers at the minimum, right? <laughs> Whatever those are. <laughs> Whatever those are, right? So we have quite... <laughs> And I'm careful to say modifiers. Now we didn't talk about particles, mm -hmm. affixes, and clitics so much, uh, but uh, they're all part of the phrase oftentimes and they're different kind of levels of attachment. They're morphological items that have different levels of attachment. It's typically don't stand on their own outside of a phrase, let's say. Maybe just a real quick example. We've already seen affixes in cat cats. That plural S one is a suffix, which is a kind of affix. A clitic in English is the word the, which can be, will be pronounced the if a vowel sound follows. Uh, what's a good example of a modifier? So, I, or I, I don't know. I, I've never heard that the is a clitic before. I've only ever heard that it was a particle. Well, to me, the particle is kind of just a grab bag. I don't know that it's really, is there a good definition of it? Can we, there is. The boundary so, we can draw between, so there's right. a line between pretty, clitic, particle, clitic, and affix. There's actually a, kind of an intricate subject because one of the ways that you deduce these things is through process of elimination right but essentially there's a there's phonological and syntactic behavior that is unique to each and an affix right will always the main difference between affix and a clitic is what level they attach to the affix will always attach directly to the say lead word the head the root the stem but the clitic will attach always at the phrase level there is an, a clitic in English. It is the possessive, but it's it's not clear to see it. You would say like, you know, the Queen of England's chair, yeah. and like it's not the chair of England's England. Chair is it the Queen mm -hmm. of the chair? You know, etc. Because it's attaching at the whole phrase, and that shows you right. Now particles are not phonologically bound, but they are bound within the phrase, right? So it'd be very hard to show if a determiner like the is a particle or a clitic. We would your idea about uh, vowel changing. I believe is the best evidence that it might be a clitic. Um, but unfortunately that happens also with all particles and prepositions and stuff like two. I would say like, do you want to swim? But I really, I'm saying this word too, but I say but you almost an inaudible probably after another alveolar, you're not even going to hear the alveolar and the T. But just to say, this is a, a whole huge topic, uh, multiple dissertations worth of topics on how we separate these things. So we, we're going to get into it too much today. If you want to know more, please contact Lango, get at me. And we might even have a podcast on this particular topic since it's coming up. Although it's not, doesn't seem to be always a huge issue in the world's major languages. If you 
like me, are describing undescribed languages or little described languages, you're going to have to do some careful detective work on is this a clitic or an affix? Is this a clitic or a particle? Because clitics act a little bit like both. But in a modifier, is a, that's a real grab bag, whatever you think is modifying. So we're going to kind of leave a pin in this for now and not do too much examples. Yeah, let's move on. But it's going to become relevant again. It, it'll all circle back. So what, why I bring it up is because there are different types of phrases when we go back to why phrases are useful to the learner. And the phrases are labeled for their part of speech, right? Now, In what the problem sense? is, of course, we mm -hmm. haven't defined part of speech yet either. A lot <laughs> of these things are interdependent, right? Uh, this is natural with things that are complex. It's hard to look at their parts in isolation to understand the behavior of the whole. Typically complex things like language can't, you must look at the whole thing at once, unfortunately. So we're talking about the, we're using this word on the screen. It's called the head of a phrase. And that's what the phrase is uh, labeled after. So we're gonna look right quick at parts of speech so that we know, um, so we can get our heads on straight for our phrasal heads, right? Okay, so <laughs> that was a low bar syntax joke. Nobody should appreciate that. I am so grateful for the groans and laughs. <laughs> You guys are my friends. I don't expect listeners to think that's funny. Low okay, bar. So. <laughs> Moving on. Low bar. One, one way, um, a maybe more technical term for part of speech is lexical category, right? Lexicon refers to... A stock of words that we have as speakers. Yeah, let's, I, was, I, was saying, I think that's a great definition, a stock of words that you have. So a lexical has to do with words. Category, of course, is the bucket it's put in. <laughs> So this is also parts of speech. Some common lexical categories include nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, and adpositions. Remember, and an adposition is preposition or postposition. Be aware that languages have different sets. The ones that we have for English are not applicable to all languages. So your mileage may vary. Yeah, that's right. We we are going to give some specific examples how this notion is more slippery between. It's pretty clear in English. If you are an English speaker, you may have an idea about it, but this may not be the same when you study your new language. If you are new to English and listening to this podcast, it may not be the same as your first language in English. So how to do, how to define? Well, a noun is not merely a person, place, or thing, which is the definition I was given in grade school. And probably mm -hmm. many Americans at least were given this definition. Good starting Maybe. point. What's that? A good starting point. Yeah, it's it, this is a, a semantic definition a, by a meaning definition. And it's not a bad starting point, but it's not quite crispy enough for <laughs> syntax, right? So the syntax itself often indicates what class the word is, right? So in English, uh, we may touch this a little bit later, but just for a quick example while it's uh, on your mind, the word jump itself is not necessarily a verb or a noun. If I say um, they jump a lot, then it's the verb, right? You've got a subject, they, it's being modified by an adverb a lot, right? Well, if I say, um, we, maybe we're talking about someone at the trampoline park and I would say, you did a, a nice jump. Well, in that case, we know it's got an adjective, a determiner, it is a noun, right? So we're, we'll touch this a little more in a second, but as with complex things, I've got to give you a lot at once. That's what we're here for. Right. So we're, we're going to do another a, a counter example there. A lot of English words are marked, so to speak, for word class. Collide is only going to be a verb, not a noun, and collision, vice versa. Mm. And that's partially, of course, because what language it comes from into English would be very clear on that. So there's, there's native English examples we could mention, too, if you'd rather. Uh, let's see. Quick and quickly, Where is for, for, instance. for example. Uh, anyhow, though, we're going to look at that actually a little bit on this next slide here, which is a typology of lexical category. So like Tyler was saying a couple minutes ago, the parts of speech are not universal, right? Not all languages have all parts of speech and not all languages distinguish parts of speech in the same ways. And let's also mention for the uninitiated what a typology is. Here we're using it in the sense of like a survey of what's around, right? 
yeah, the different types that there are, quite literally, an ology of types. Mm -hmm. So uh, some common types of phrases, it seems that most languages have some corner of the grammar which distinguishes verbs from nouns. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was I studied with Dr. Tim Montler uh, a little bit about the Klallam language um, of Washington State. And when you were learning Klallam, it seems like maybe there's no difference between verbs and nouns at all. They can all take a lot of the same modifiers. Um, they can all be inflected for person, for example. But uh, uh, Dr. Mottler has published a single paper which shows that in a tiny corner of the grammar, actually nouns are treated a little bit different than verbs. So it's not crucial if you, there are many people out there learning Klallam right now, and maybe for the first thing, it's not important to learn this distinction, but at some level of sophistication, they probably will learn the distinction. Whereas if you are learning a language where the distinction is very salient, like Portuguese, mm -hmm. then you pretty much have to learn the dis distinction on the first lesson, right? So each language kind of has its own level of how mm -hmm. they, not only just how they distinguish nouns from verbs, but how much they distinguish nouns from verbs. Um, and other things, more slippery. For example, maybe languages don't, dis a certain language might not distinguish adjectives from adverbs. It's just any sort of modifier can attach to any sort of head, for example. Or maybe languages don't 100% distinguish adjectives from verbs, but more mm -hmm. on that spicy possibility in a couple minutes. Stay tuned. Stay awesome. tuned. Hint, it's Korean. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so a quick look at nouns and verbs in English. Now we already looked at this with jump a little bit, but they are distinguished nouns and verbs by their slot, their position, their spot in the syntax. So again, um, our main character, Liz, Liz went for a run, Liz runs to work. Now in Liz went for a run, then run is a noun. We know in part because it's got an article before it, a, uh, which is the English indefinite article for nouns that begin with a consonant, right? Uh, and then Liz runs to work. Now, um, this z in runs uh, tells us, English speakers, that the subject of run is a third person singular person in present tense. So this, even though it sounds like the plural in English, it's not, it's a different thing. And it tells us that it's a verb. Furthermore, their position in the mm -hmm. sentence helps us know because English has a somewhat rigid word order of subject, verb, and object. So the morphology helps as we've looked at with, uh, I'm counting everything in the phrase from particles to affixes as part of the morphology in this example. Um, it's useful if you're describing languages as a note to think about things this way. But the morphology, though it's language specific, helps us. And in this case, within the noun phrase a uh, run, the particle a uh, helps us know what the noun is. And within the verb phrase runs to work, the agreement z on run helps us know what the verb is, right? So verbs can, some common patterns, if, you, if you're going to a language you know nothing about, some things to have in mind, maybe these will be upset, but probably this is how it's going to be. Verbs can be inflected for tense and aspect, right? And just let's remind people what tense refers to. So tense are things people camp in. Uh, <laughs> what happens is, is they put up some cloth and some, I'm joking, of course. Tense, when we refer to English is T-E, or when we refer to language is T-E-N-S-E. -E, and we're talking about time of the event, past, present, future, typically. Aspect is more a, a little bit more of a detailed information. For example, has the event been completed or not? Is this a habitual event, right? Things like this are included. English doesn't have the most, most rich aspect or maybe even tense, some might argue, but we can, in the end, negotiate everything as every language can. Quite a bit going on, it's something uh, non-native speakers struggle with quite a bit. It's challenging, no matter, in my experience, no matter what the second language is, you're gonna struggle a bit with tense and aspect. Um, so what to look for in nouns is that nouns are typically inflected for things like plurality and definiteness, right? Now there are counterexamples to both of these generalizations, but I wanted to note there, 
What might not be predictable is that there are indeed some languages that mark the definiteness of nouns on verbs, right? So one example is the Owa language of Papua New Guinea, which was uh, grammar of which was written as a dissertation by my former office mate, Russell Barlow. That's how I happen to know that example. Though there are other examples, I know sometimes syntacticians look for a definiteness correlation when someone claims there's object agreement, which was the case with Owa, if I recall correctly. Right. So these are what you want your expectations to be if you're studying a brand new language though you can, they might be uh, upset by it. I think if you study a major world language, this will probably pan out pretty well. But if you start studying the great diversity of world's languages, you'll start finding more counterexamples. Okay, now I told you a little bit before about what the head of a phrase is, right? So now let's talk about a noun as the head of a noun phrase. What goes inside the noun phrase? This is English specific, but we like things, us speakers of English, like things like nouns and adjectives, determiners, right? and numerals, quantifiers, etc. inside of our noun phrases. Um, in some theoretical frameworks, right? some ways of looking at it, elements within a phrase can be the head of their own phrase. Right? So some theories will say that uh, an adjective within a noun phrase heads its own adjective phrase, even though it's subordinate, let's say. Some theories, perhaps the most prominent theory of formal syntax today proposes that a determiner is in fact the head of the, you know, there's a determiner phrase and within that is a noun phrase, right? Other theories propose a determiner is just a part subordinate to the noun phrase. This is not super crucial for you as the language learner. If you're just curious about it, uh, you can probably go do a lot of study and maybe even write a dissertation on this exact topic. But just to say that we need to acknowledge that the elements have their own meaning too. What's interesting is in English, speakers know the order of elements. If you have a lot of adjectives or descriptors or modifiers within a noun phrase, people are going to know which ones go in which order. So I'm going to give you a small example. Um, we've sketched out here a phrase structure rewrite rule, which is uh, within our noun phrase, determiners go at the beginning, modifiers go in the middle and can be stacked. That's what our formalism, if you're watching a screen, that's what our formalism means. But don't worry too much about formalism. And then finally, it ends with a noun. Of course, we know this isn't always true because we have a couple post-nominal modifiers like galore, right? You can say we have noun phrases galore. More relative clauses can go there. Yeah, relative clauses uh, can go there, but they have their own structure. That's like a, well, within... Of course, depends on your theoretical framework. I'm not assuming everybody believes like me. But just to keep it simple, this is a nice little phrase uh, structure rule you can look at. And we have a simple one here as our first example, the yeah. blue dog. Let's read right? aloud for, the, for those just listening. The, the structure is debt for determiner is the first element in a noun phrase. Optionally, modifiers, any number of them. And then finally, the noun is the last component as we have it. Yeah, this is here prototypical noun phrase is going to look like that. So here we have a simple one here, the blue dog. The is the determiner. Blue is our single modifier and dog is our head of the noun phrase. Now we get a more complex one, the 10 angry blue dogs, and we have stacked these modifiers. Now we have three modifiers. Now, I think maybe all is acceptable. I'm going to see what you guys think. But if we start scrambling these modifiers, I think uh -huh. first language speakers will probably agree the 10 angry blue dogs is the right order. Better than the blue 10 angry dogs or the angry blue 10 dogs. If you say the angry blue 10 dogs, it, we're expecting a context like, oh, are you talking about the angry blue nine dogs or the angry blue 10 dogs, right? We're expecting some sort of contrast like this. So when you upset the natural order, it actually includes certain, let's say, presuppositions, although we'll, I'm not going to get too far into semantics on this. But just to say, first language speakers typically know which order is best. And when you upset the order, they're expecting some sort of extra information. Right? I have a challenge for any listeners. What is the longest noun phrase you can make in English? Now, if you are a fan of the theory of recursion, you might say, 
that you can make an endless noun phrase. In which case, get started now. <laughs> yeah, but the problem is pragmatically, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you have to sleep at some time. You mm -hmm. know, it's going to end. Right, the, it has to be speakable, so there's limits to that. Yes, there is a there is a theoretical limitation and then a limitation in practice, and those things do not align in this case. And but, the listener, how much memory they, do they have to retain what you're going to say? That's so crucial. I think that's often one of the most overlooked aspects in theoretical linguistics, although now, of course, it's very popular, I guess, to do a lot of perception-based stuff. But yeah, how much, can your, how much can your listener really remember? Be mindful of that when you're making phrases in your second language with 13 adjectives. <laughs> Anyhow, send us your longest NPs, tag us on Twitter. Uh, if they're real good, we'll RT. So moving on. Now, I want to tell you a story the Jedi wouldn't tell you. Ooh. The story the Jedi would tell you is that you can have headless noun phrases, right? So what is a headless noun phrase? You can have a noun phrase with no overt noun as the head. There is a Sanskrit word for this, bahuvrihi, uh, which is an exocentric compound, right? A type of, so this is a type of headless noun phrase. Uh, now, bahuvrihi is an example of itself. Uh, the Sanskrit grammarians uh, very cleverly came up with types of compounds, and they often, it, it, in most phenomena, named it after an example of that. And that might be a good thing for us to do in mainstream modern linguistics, too. So, so the word, um, did Tyler leave? It literally means much rice, right? Having a lot of rice, right? For a rich person, I believe. Referring to fertile land, but um, now it denotes just the quality of being rich. Yeah. Yeah. So that example, the word itself is a cool example. Yeah. So um, we have these in English too, although I was trying to think if we have one like that in English and my mind is running blank, mm -hmm. like breadwinner actually has the winner in it. So it's not mm -hmm. very good. Things like this. But anyways, a bahu rihi is a class of compound, which is externally headed. Some of my favorite examples in English come from uh, the species of duck <laughs> names. So one species of duck is called a canvas back, right? A duck which has one which has a canvas back, but the haver of it, the haver of the canvas back is not overtly mentioned, right? The same for uh, ring neck. It's and not a kind of back is the point too. I think right. the same with ring neck. It's not a type of neck. It's a type of duck which has a ringed neck. The same for redhead which is, I guess, can you use that for maybe humans too? I think about it as a duck thing. Mm. You could see where my mind is at. <laughs> um, right, so uh, in English, we use them a lot for what I'm calling as schoolyard put downs. So a lot of these tend to be pejorative in English. I tried to pick ones that are not that mean, but if you are a first language speaker of English or even a savvy second language speaker, you will understand the point of this and know where it's going. My examples are four eyes, which I have been called a lot as a child because I wear glasses. Aw. It's cool. I'd be five eyes <laughs> if I could. It doesn't bother me. Right here. Doesn't bother me. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> yeah, like uh, uh, four eyes is not modifying eyes. Right. It's saying. If, if someone calls you four eyes, they're not talking to your eyes. Yeah, they're saying one who has four eyes, right? Um, I'm ashamed to say when I was, you know, a child, I called my little brother Booger Brain a lot. That was one I said to him. Maybe he doesn't love it. Uh, and I apologize if you're listening, but he isn't. But, what a bully. Uh, what a bully. I know I didn't mean to be, but I said <laughs> I called him Booger Brain. So I know that that's one you can come up with. I have never called anyone dog breath, but you could imagine that someone might use that as a put down meaning you have dog breath by mm -hmm. calling you dog breath, right? So um, particularly if you can think of nicer things to say, the challenge is <laughs> what's your best bahuvrihi? Again, you know, tag us on Twitter. If it's good, we'll RT. <laughs> or give us your spiciest insult. I can take it. I'll, I'll field those. Yeah. My favorite is hound's tooth for the fabric. Oh, all right. No name for the, it Not looks like little dog teeth. That dovetails nicely. <laughs> <laughs> okay now something we're not going to talk about quite as much in this podcast but a little bit is 
the verb phrase. Now, what's inside? Obviously, at least verbs, right? Or a verb, yeah. right? There's this other thing though called a verb complement, right? So syntactic objects are complements of the verb. This is how we view it in linguistics. And I'm about to give you some easy evidence. You know, if the licorice flavored pizza was not evidence enough for you, we can look at this VP. Uh, we have a first wave of VP of a so-called intransitive sentence. Now, intransitive sentences have no object. So we get Liz slept. If I were to do an OCM test and say, what did Liz do? You might say slept is what Liz did, right? Now, our second sentence, Liz ate the cake. You might say something like, what did Liz do? And I might say, ate the cake. Now, the complement within the VP, the object noun phrase, is itself a constituent within a constituent. Because I could say, what did Liz eat? And you would say, the cake. Right. So um, you'll notice this when you start studying languages, that there is this uh, kind of special relationship between the object and the verb. Sentences are generally implied to have subjects. Uh, for in English, it's like a it's like a a really highly ranked priority. You got to have some subject. That's why we say things like it's rain. It's raining. What is it? In it's raining. Right. What well, it refer to? But there's a counter example of our very important class of utterances where you really kind of have to omit the subject, and that is things like thank you. Man. Never will say I thank you. Well, we do occasionally. Rarely do we say I thank you. Generally mm. for imperatives, and that's cross-linguistic. Generally too. imperatives are you, you drop the subject because you're thank addressing. You. Thank you cannot be an imperative. I agree. Yeah, all right. I agree. Well, we're clear. But thank you is more like a, a bit idiomatic, an idiomatic thing. But just to say that the property is... Even in big classes like imperatives, you can have one where you can insert the subject. Yeah, it's marked to insert the subject. Mm -hmm. You get out of here. In super, you just super, do super, it. super polite speech, someone might say like, I sincerely thank you or something, but it's marked, right? The same way, like if I say like, you know, Tyler, eat the cake, you know, it's marked where I should just say eat the cake. Right? That That's not a subject. I wouldn't say it's going to gonna be as soon as I do the action and you sum it up that way but that was what that's what we call evocative that you're using my name as a form of address to me it's different from a subject of a sentence what about oh, we'll Otherwise, talk about yes right tyler eats the cake mm -hmm. yeah i agree hmm, okay there is I, I think that like um well it's worth it's worth checking i've got to think about yeah i think um there are definitely going to be languages where you're going to get second person agreement and subject agreement in imperatives, but that should be a podcast for another day. I, I'll go down the rabbit hole on that because I've looked at imperatives in uh, languages of Borneo. So it's little described languages, which you're not going to find a lot of resource at, but I've, this is where I came up with some of these generalizations. But it, if you love this stuff, you got to leave us some comments and let us know and we'll do a whole podcast on it. What's not to love? I don't know. I love it all. I just think we'd talk about it for the next 10 hours. Personally. <laughs> um, but anyways, we're going to go on and talk about why is the complement part of the VP, right? So because they act as a constituent, right? So we actually kind of talked about this just a second ago when I say they eat, they eat the cake. I picked it so there's less agreement problems. Eat the cake is what they do. Now, when we say they eat the cake, they eat the cake is our example sentence. When we move certain things, it doesn't work anymore, thus showing us it's for sure a chunk, a constituent. So eat the cake is what they do. Totally fine because eat the cake is a constituent and they eat the cake. But eat is what they do the cake. Uh, I think maybe people re recover the meaning here, but it's certainly not, it's, uh, it's marked speech again, to use the same term. Mm -hmm. It sounds like maybe something a, a broadcaster might do if they're speaking before they know the end result. I hear I watch MMA a lot, and there was this. He he doesn't work for the company anymore, but this former famous broadcaster, and he would say things like, um, "Punched him in the face is what he did," like this kind of mm -hmm. Yoda talking type thing a lot or whatever. And but in normal typical conversational speech, if you say something like "eat" is what they do the cake, that's very strange. So 
that lets you know there's a special relationship with eat and the cake. Now, another bad example that sounds similar but further shows a constituency is um, eat is what they, the cake, do, right? Ooh. So if you switch around the auxiliaries, it still doesn't solve things. That's why I put that in there. Some people might think, oh, well, that's because you've got this do support in there from your test. No, if you move that stuff around, it's still bad. Mm -hmm. This is even more marked to me. Since we're talking about eating cake, um, I have some food for thought, <laughs> <laughs> right? Food for thought is the sentence a constituent, right? Because you can do the whole thing as reported speech. I used they eat the mm -hmm. cake as a constituent a lot of times now, right? So uh, if you were a theoretical syntactician, you surely already have a take on this and you may want to fight to the death over it. But if you're not, if you're not a theoretical um syntactician this is something that might be a good way for you to a good thing for you to think about and i would suggest you make your own generalizations um in an introductory syntax class it's not uncommon to teach someone that s is the head of the whole uh we have a, a type mm -hmm. of formalism that we use to diagram sentences in syntax we call them trees that's for a sentence and s stands for sentence because some people view the sentence as a whole constituent um, and that's a nice way to look about it and think about it when you're a language learner, in my opinion. So uh, maybe we sh should look at a little bit of this in action. Actually, not. We're actually going to take a step back now, and I'm just going to look a little bit about nouns and verbs in Portuguese for our first um, part of comparatively speaking today, right? So, uh, as discussed in a previous slide, for nouns in Portuguese, you get a certain type of agreement, which is gender and number. Now, remember, gender in Portuguese can correlate with natural gender. Yeah, it can correlate with uh, the gender of a person, a speaker, mm. of a, or or of a, of a perceived gender of an animal. But it's really kind of, in most cases, acts as a noun class. Um, it's not. It's a type of classification. So we're, we're not uh, trying to step on any toes with this gender example. We're not talking about, we're not enforcing binary gender. This is the way- This Portuguese is grammatical works. gender. Right. It's really mm -hmm. about noun classes. We, the, term, the term comes from language study originally. It was a grammatical term, this word gender. Some languages have two, some have three, some have, there may be some four gender ones, but that's about the upper limit, I think. There's Bantu languages with over a dozen. Those are noun classes, though. That's slightly different from gender. I mean, it functions much the same, but I think you can delineate between those two types of things. They do because they have the concord and everything. It does function much the same. Anyways, I have a question for you, Tyler, that is a small aside since we brought up this um, controversial topic or interesting topic from a linguist perspective. I have heard that the word gender is a doublet for the word genre yeah, and that they both mean kind right. originally. Kind is cognate. Genus is the third, the, the triplet. Oh, so kind <laughs> cool. is the English word, the old Germanic word for it. Right. Kind of thing, we mean not kind as in nice. They may be related to, I'm not sure, but yeah, kind of the noun. Grouping things. Genus, genus, genre, and oh, also, yeah, genera, the plural. You can see mm. the R. It's a nice mnemonic to remember that it, what it means for for our context here for grammatical gender. So, right. Related to those terms. And so when you look at grammatical gender in Portuguese on nouns, going back to what we were originally talking about, uh, my example here is o gato, the cat. Now, the o at the beginning is the article for the masculine gender in Portuguese, right? And this cat, gato, ends with an O, even though I'm pronouncing it a bit with an O sound. That's a, a process in Portuguese. Um, if you mix the article with the noun ending, such as a gato, it is ungrammatical because they have to agree with each other. Now, they agree in gender, but they also agree in number. Number being the distinction between single and plural. In os gatos, the cats, if you were to say, oh, gatush, so you got the gender right, but not the plurality, it would be wrong. Right. The same if you said, oh, gato, but it was one, 
that would be wrong. They have to agree there. The asterisk for it, show that something is wrong. Do not say these if you're learning Portuguese. This is That's right. If you're looking at the slide, we have marked the incorrect forms with stars. Now, verbs also have their own agreement system. Verbs agree in person, number, and tense. So they also agree whether it is plural or singular, but the agreement forms are entirely different. Not only that, person, number, and tense on a verb in Portuguese are all one suffix or one morpheme, if it's not a suffix, if it's just a part of it. It's all, we call this kind of morphology, as a note in linguistics, we call this kind of morphology synthetic morphology because it's all put together. So in the phrase, I eat, eu como, if you, let me read the examples and I'll tell you the bad ones and it'll all make sense. I <laughs> eat, eu como, right? Como, this O at the end, indicates first person, me, singular, not us, me, and present tense. For third person, singular, present tense, she, she eats, you get ela come, right? And it sounds like an I sound at the end, E, but it's spelled with an yeah. E sound, like the letter E in English. Can you show us? It's on the screen. Oh. It's the next example. Not showing up for me. There it goes. There we go. So oh. maybe we should, I just want to briefly take a step back and clarify what we mean by agreement. The, you have agreement as whenever one form of one word harmonizes or responds to some feature in another word. In the, within the same phrase in, in both these cases with the noun and the verb right we're right. saying U and gatu are two words and the one has to match the other they agree right and the same with eu and como right so there i have the third now you can see now you know the third person singular present tense is come spelled c-o-m-e but maybe pronounced come in fast speech you get ela come now if i had eu come that would be wrong Come. That would be wrong, right? I ate past tense. I ate is eu comi. And that one is spelled with the letter I. She ate el comeu. Right. Now, when you start mixing those, it becomes wrong. It can be wrong even, right, if you mean present tense and say past tense. That can be wrong. But the main point of it, I mean... It might be grammatically correct, but you said what you didn't mean to. And I know uh, when I was new to Portuguese, one mistake I made a lot was speaking in present tense when I meant past tense. Maybe that's not a common mistake, but that was a mistake I made a lot. So I, my sentences were grammatical. But people did not understand the meaning that I intended. So that's also mm -hmm. possible. And it's a less bad error than mixing up person, but still relevant. And the point of all this is that when you look at the morphology, what happens to the words as you inflect meaning or tense or whatever is different for nouns than verbs. And this is a good argument that these word classes are very different in Portuguese. Noun and verbs are not the same. They're very distinct in Portuguese. Uh, so let me just point out, yeah, we have, we can have the similar sounding and similar spelled marker in these two cases, but mm -hmm. they differently, mean different things. So in principle, we can separate them from each other completely. Happens to that's be right. an O in the first singular como, and also an O in ugatu, but that's just an accident, not the same O, so to speak. That's right. O is just a common letter or sound. Words need vowels, and there's only those five. <laughs> Words need vowels. You know, that's don't true. tell don't tell every dialect of Berber. Not in a <laughs> certain dialect, I just don't recall. I remember studying a puzzle in Don Casteriade's class nice. where we solved one where they allow all sorts of things to be the nucleus of a syllable, including K. So Ooh. words need vowels. That's just like your opinion, dude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Does save that one. Okay, save that <laughs> observation. Okay, so our next uh, topic here is comparatively speaking. And we're going to look at verbs and adjectives in Korean. And Lisa is going to tell us a little bit about it as the Korean teacher here at Lango. All right. Um, yeah. So verbs and adjectives in quotes here. Um, and this is something that I really uh, realized in Dr. Matt Shibatani's class at Rice. 
um, he taught a syntax class where we looked at um, sort of a, the prototypical notions of word class and then we poked holes in it for different languages. I looked at Korean and um, discovered that really um, adjectives in Korean are actually verbs. So let me tell you more about that. So in Korean, the category of verb is much more comprehensive. It's a very important word class. Um, it uh, helps you define a lot of semantic contrast in the language. And it includes both words that denote actions, so action verbs, and words that denote states. And I like to call them descriptive verbs. Um, you can also think of them as adjectives it helps, if it helps you as a learner. Um, but importantly, they behave like verbs in that they can take tense and then other markings on the verb, like uh, speech style. And they also go in the same place in the sentence. Right. Yeah, so syntactic criteria. How do you distinguish these? Um, there's a number of strategies. The first strategy is for action verbs. They're going to form their present tense. Um, in one of the speech styles called the plain or narrative style, all right? And I have the form here. It's nunda, and the parentheses shows uh, the, the syllable that might be added on if the verb stem ends in a consonant. And we have one example here um, that adds a syllable. And Tyler is going to help me mm -hmm. uh, put up Romanized. the romanization here. For those of you who are don't know any Korean at all, okay. So our first example has Tyler and I. I'm going to use your Korean name, Changmuni Kimchiter Mongnunda, right? And we have Changmun, the subject marked with an E, Changmuni. The object Kimchi, which is Kimchi, delicious, and uh, the object marked here with Lil. And then here's our verb. The verb stem is mok for eat. And then we're gonna add nunda, the plain or narrative speech style, right? And we know when we do that, that it is an action verb. It also comes at the end of the sentence. All right, so Korean is a verb final language and a lot of elements can drop out, but you need that verb at the end there. All right, next example. I'm gonna bring Pita in to my lesson too. We have Peter is working out. Peter ga undongul handa. And this time we're gonna add the other variant uh, suffix here, which attaches on to a verb stem that ends with a vowel. All mm -hmm. right, so we have Pita subject marker ga undong, which is ex uh, exercise or working out, and ul the object marker. And then our action verb, ha, which means do, becomes and handa in the present tense. Just for, uh, just to repeat, the nunda in the first example and the nda in the second, mm -hmm. those are the same thing. Yep, so they're okay. just variants uh, that depend on what the verb stem is, whether there's a consonant uh, in the verb stem or a vowel. So we have mong nunda, eating, and then handa, doing. Working out. All right, so that's the action verb. Whoop. <laughs> and then descriptive verbs, on the other hand, they're going to form their present tense without an added suffix. And this is very helpful because um, a lot of times this looks like the dictionary form, which also ends in just da here or infinitive form. Um, but descriptive verbs are unique in that they can form the present tense without adding anything. It looks like the dictionary form. In the first example here, we have Korean is fun. 한국어는 재미있다. Right? 한국어, Korean language, 는, the topic marker. And 재미, eat, is fun. We just yeah. end in a ta, which looks like Funness fun. exists there, that's what I'm saying. Do what? Funness exists. Indeed. Ita. I agree. Literal. It can this form can also actually be fused to chen too, which is very fun. Chemita. All right, second example. Naishiga chuta. The weather is good. So similarly here we have uh, the verb chuta to be good. And nashi weather. 
And here, no change here, just uh, same, same as the infinitive form, ta. So we're saying the ninda cannot apply to these verbs, right? We couldn't say right. ninda, that would sound bad. Right, that is marked. That's not how to form the descriptive verb form in the present tense. Not right? nice to cho ninda. No, nope, yeah. marked, yeah. Yeah, so that might be a common uh, mistake if you just think it's a, a different word class here, but it's a verb and um, you know that it's descriptive because it takes this particular, it takes no suffix here. And that, yeah, that, that, so whenever you see that suffix, that'll tell you this is an action verb, not a descriptive verb. It's a good thing to take note of as you're studying Korean. Nay, hopefully my students are tuning in here. Um, this is a, a good thing to keep reminding yourself especially with uh, English gravity, you expect adjectives to do something very different. All right, strategy number two, action verbs are gonna have the present tense ad nominal form. So whenever they modify a noun, they're gonna show up with this form un attached to them. And here the variant is shown. Uh, it's either gonna add a new syllable un or have the, uh, the n sound uh, fuse right into the verb stem there. So continuing with my um, eating kimchi example, because Tyler loves kimchi, I have here, um, we're going to modify Changmun with eating. So Changmun who is eating kimchi. And here we'll have the verb stem mok, and we're going to attach nun because it ends with a consonant. So kimchi er mok nun Changmun. Okay, so yeah, it was the same verb we had on the last slide, mm -hmm. here, it's not sentence final, because it's not functioning as the verb in the clause. Modify. Right. Yep. And um, you want more here, because there needs to be a verb, right, to, to form right. a sentence here. Um, yeah, it's unfinished. But yeah, the position also tells you. All right, and then the second example, we have Peter, who is working out. Um, so here we're going to move the action form here um, and apply nun before Peter. So, undongul hanen Peter. And here we have the nun variant. Undongul hanen Peter. So, actually, here we should have said that the base form is nun because that's what we see in both cases. Seems to be invariant. Whoops, uh, you're uh, right. Oh, yeah, I should say nun here. Let's fix that annotation there. So derived from a verb root, but working like our adjective in that it's pointing at a noun, basically mm -hmm. modifying a noun. Hmm. And the noun being the head of its part is phrase final. In the yeah, example. so this in the present tense form, but actually, yeah, you can make a past tense ad nominal too by using un, so <laughs> just a direct mention. Like the different suffix, right? Yeah. All right. So, how uh, to distinguish descriptive verbs from the action verb? Um, here's the form with the present tense ad nominal form un, right? And I have an asterisk there because there are some variant forms, variant strategies as well, but this is the main one. So, I have here, continue on with my examples good weather. We can attach un to chota to be good. 좋은 날씨, weather. Okay, and my example with the verb stem ending in a vowel is 예쁘다, to be pretty. And to that, we attach the variant form 네, 예쁜. Mm. So 예쁜 옷, pretty clothes. Worth noting that the 으 in the second case, that sound 으 written EU, it belongs to the root in that one, 예쁘다. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the upper one, Joen, it belongs to the suffix. So Very I'm true. showing the boundary with a little hyphen in the Roman letters. Very nice. Yeah, that's an important class of these uh, descriptive verbs too, because they have some variant patterns. Mm. All right, and to make it even more Tim, a small set of words can function as either one of these, either action or descriptive verbs. And this is a wonderful example because it also has the nominalized form of, it, of this word. Um, it's kuda, which means to be big. And here in the sentence, I have it, uh, the tall person's height is still increasing. 
So we have 큰 here at the beginning, 큰 사람, the tall person, in its adjective form here or descriptive verb form. 큰 사람의 키, the height. 아직도 큰다, still, and then 큰다, increasing in the action verb form. So here we have it in both, yeah, both functions, as I said. The root 크 is common to that first word and the last word in the clause. Hmm. But they belong to different categories. So tall and, then, and increasing. Mm -hmm. And you can also tell by the position in the sentence, the slot in the sentence. All right. There are also many strategies to convert descriptive verbs into action verbs. And these are the two main ones, but there's many more. And to learn all of them, you got to take Korean with us. Um, but the first one, the beginners will learn. Um, and that's by adding all or ahada to be or do X to the verb stem. So here's an example of the descriptive verb form. Chuta means to be good. And then when we add ahada, chuahada, it becomes to like something. It requires an object there. Now, this is a cool example because there's additional semantic differences here. So if you say chuta, um, it could, it's a little bit ambiguous as to whether it's good or you like something. But when you use this other form, the action verb form, chuahada, it's very clear that um, you're expressing that you like something particular object there. Hmm. 여러분 좋아해요? <laughs> like it? 좋아해요. All right, and then by adding another strategy is by adding or ajida. And this is a really cool form as well. It means to become X. And my two examples is 춥다, to be cold. And when we add the chida, this form fuses here, it becomes chu wa chida to become cold. A little change to the form of the root, but it's the mm -hmm. same thing. A little just... change and it becomes more of an action verb. Very neat. The chi, this one does not occur as its own verb root, right? It can only be a suffix, am I? Right, yeah, it, it has to, yeah, it can't stand alone. Yeah, chida. So it's a suffix, it's an affix, and of course it's a morpheme, everything's a morpheme, but it's not a root, not a standalone thing. Right, yeah. And all of these examples kind of uh, actually hint at something else that's typologically observed across mm -hmm. linguistics is that um, there's actually a lot of different types of verbs, meaning like act active and stative, for example, are types mm -hmm. of verbs. Um, and it's neat how different languages um, kind of indicate these differences morphologically and like our probably becoming our favorite saying here all grammars leak via Edward mm -hmm. Sapir usually there's a point where it doesn't well there's descriptive verbs and action verbs except when there's not, <laughs> except when there's not right <laughs> yeah yeah but hopefully that um, is something delightful for learners as well right it would be really yeah. boring if there weren't any any variants to think about in my opinion yes as a as a current korean language student uh this is extremely interesting i hope that uh all the korean language students out there eventually hear this this comparatively speaking section um snippet sometime hope yeah so. definitely super interesting come to lango learn korean from us so then that leads us to the Chinese segment, nouns versus verbs in Chinese. So in Chinese, famously, there's no morphology. There are no suffixes or prefixes added to mark inflection or any of that. Chinese I think this is quiet. a big selling point for Chinese because people are very intimidated, I think, to about Chinese. There's tones and a lot of, you know, the, writing the characters, which I think is really fun, but it might be intimidating to think about. Um, but yeah, when you get to the morphology, Nothing there. <laughs> Nothing. All of that komu komi stuff, which is such a headache when you're learning a romance language, which I also love, of course. I love all the romance languages. But in Chinese, there's none of that. You don't have to worry about inflection or agreement. You just say the words as they want to come out naturally. You just so have to remember what happens if there's a lot of three. And there's a lot here. What's that, Peter? What? Sorry, I lost the last thing you said, Tyler. I thought you were done talking. Started talking. I couldn't hear you. You just have to remember what? 
the number for four? What do you mean? Oh, what, what happens if all the three tones are in a row? That's what you oh, have to No morphology, but you do have to remember some stuff. True. Yeah. Whew. yeah. Pretty compact though, once you get those those few tone changes of Mandarin, which is the most important dialect for learners. But anyway, let's get into the meat of this one. This lesson, Chinese has no verb agreement or noun inflection. Plural marking is a thing. It's only done on pronouns though. I, you, he, she. And if there's a few nouns for humans that can take this little suffix mun. There, there are suffixes. I, I shouldn't say they don't exist, but they're, think of them as more optional in English. In English, it's required to say children if it's more than one in mm -hmm. Chinese, just naming the noun in a single form does for all of it. Many words appear in both roles talking about noun and verb, so both noun or verb. And in fact, our English glosses for this show the same behavior as Chinese. My first example, I ni means I love you. What I've put in brackets here, the I ni part is our verb phrase. It's got the verb I and an object. So the, the part in blue, I, it means to love. Here it's used as a verb. We can tell from the syntax, from what it's between, what's going on in the sentence. One agent and an experiencer or object or whatever you want to call it. Two nouns involved here. And in the next example, this was the name and refrain of a song that was everywhere when I lived in China 15 years ago. Woman, <laughs> the I means our love. So here we see a little bit of that morphology, which is mostly not used. Wa is the same in both these examples. Refers to I, me. Mun makes a plural, and this little da makes a possessive of any pronoun. So the love, that's our head noun in this case, no longer a verb, modified by possessor, our love. Make sense? Yeah, that da does a lot of work, I think. It does. It's, yeah. it's a magical word. It does many wonderful things. Basically, it, that, that term ad nominal that you used a few minutes ago in the Korean one mm -hmm. is what this da does. What does da do? It points at a following noun phrase, giving you, telling you that there's modifying information preceding it. And there could be quite a big phrase. I remember um, when I sat in in your class doing an exercise where we, we bracketed all the da phrases and some of them were so long. It was really interesting. Whole sentences or doing a lot of heavy, sentences can heavy modify lifting. nouns. So the thing that I bought yesterday, in English, a relative clause following its noun, thing. In Chinese, that'll proceed. It'll be the I buy yesterday E thing. Mm -hmm. Which makes for some great translations. So note that words like I in Chinese can be both. Some things will only be nouns, but it's the rule in Chinese rather than the exception that these things, that these things shift word class. So the Chinese word I is fairly similar to the English word love, where you could say our love or I love you. That's why one of the reasons maybe the gloss works so well. Or... Yes, this case, same behavior in across both languages. So it's a different case from that collide collision where English word class is, is marked on the word itself. Chinese mm -hmm. doesn't do that. Let's go to the next. How can we tell? This raises the question. If there's no morphology like we had in Portuguese and in Korean where it's nice and easy to identify a verb or a thing derived from a verb, from a noun. How do you know one from the other in Chinese? How can we tell a noun or a noun phrase from a verb or a verb phrase? There are some helpful syntactic criteria. We, in, as in any language, we can quantify nouns, most nouns in Chinese. We can specify an amount of them. So when we do that with a noun in Chinese, like we want to say two sheets of paper, yang zhang ji, head nouns at the end, ji means paper. And the quantifying phrase, liang zhang, it consists of a numeral and a, what we call a measure word or a classifier. English has some things like this, but it's much more prevalent in Chinese. We talk about having two cups of tea rather than saying two teas. So a cup in English is a measure word and a head noun would be tea in that example. And, and here also two sheets of paper. We could say two papers, but that has a different meaning from saying two sheets of paper. Right, and it's like, glossed as sheet because there's no plural marking on it. That's also, yeah, we don't, oh, two sheet paper, yeah. <laughs> we're gonna inflect, we're gonna show that agreement for plurality of the noun. Chinese doesn't have that kind of plural marking. And an important point that I wanna make here is this kind of a quantifying phrase, the Jiang, is always gonna precede its noun. So if we have phrase structure rules, they say, if you wanna speak Chinese, you gotta put the quantifying part before the noun in Chinese. 
but verbs don't do that. If you wanted to say you did a certain verbal action a number of times, that numeral phrase is going to follow the head verb. So there's one way. If ever you see these numeral quantifiers and where they are in relation to the thing, you'll know which word class you're dealing with. I just want to appreciate that character real quick too. Yang with yeah. the, the... It's got the two-ness written all two over pairs. it. Two pairs, yeah. It's symmetry. Okay, another helpful criterion. You're for... not off the hook yet. <laughs> huh? Oh, I said you're not off the hook. <laughs> More to say, that's right. Another helpful criterion when it comes to telling a noun from a verb is negation. This is a big one. So of course we don't use a negative all the time. Some things are non-negative, but whenever you do see something negated in Chinese as a learner, pay attention. It's gonna, the type of negation used is gonna tell you about the word class of the thing being negated. Verby things, as I've labeled them, like in Korean, all, well, all of what, what are taught as adjectives in Chinese are really a subclass of verbs. Verbs, adjectives are verby things. And these in Chinese and Mandarin are always negated with bu. That's the big one. So gao means tall. Bu gao, it is not tall. We don't need a verb that corresponds to is of English because gao itself is verbal. Bu <laughs> xue means does not study, will not study. Nouns, however, that's not true. We can't just put bu right before a noun to negate it. And in fact, English not functions the same way. We can say not tall, but we can't say not student. Well, I mean, you can get not sentences where you have not student together. But in Chinese, it'll never be bu xue sheng. It'll be bu shi xue sheng. Mm -hmm. Here we have, we need that copula, a verb, a linking verb meaning to be. The shi has to be there to negate a, a nouny meaning. So-and-so is not a student. So this tells us when we see things like this, here, because it needs the shi, that's got to be a noun. Whereas xue and gao in these other examples, those are not nouns, they're verbi. Very nice, verbi. Also, uh, so the marking here is for what we were talking about, that tone shift that happens. I like to be redundant and really clear when I mark things. The basic value of this, this negative word is bu with a falling tone. Sharp-eyed readers and hearers will note that it changes when we add it to shi, bu shi. When a falling tone word follows, we get a rise. But only for this one word, we get that change. Let's go to the next slide. Compound words. Which I think we'll talk about a little bit more later. I hope so. Compound nouns and compound verbs in Chinese also show distinction in the, the negation, what's doing the negating. Again, verby things are negated with bu. So we can say bu bei. Tells us bei has to be verby, it means unprepared, not prepared. Bu an means restless, not at peace. So again, the choice of bu rather than another negative word, of which, of which there are several, tells us it's a, ah, we're looking at verby things in these cases. An can also have noun type meanings. For contrast, nouny things can be negated with fei, which is an old Chinese word meaning not be. So it includes a copula. It's a fusion of neg with copula. Fei fen is one example means, how did we, how did my dictionary translate it? Presumptuous. The literal breakdown is not, not being proportion, going beyond what is proportionate. Fei fen. If we said bu fen or bu fen, that would be different, would have a different sense. And finally, nonviolence, fei bao li. Bao li means violent, to say that it's, or violence rather than noun. To negate that meaning, we add fei rather than bu. So any questions about this? Peter, you've seen Fei in Fei Chang. The best you can be. Extraordinary, that's right. Not the ordinary one. Mm -hmm. And I think that's it for this little mini lesson. Wonderful. Yep, next we are going to move on to uh, F the Ineffable. Um, one of the last sections of our podcast schedule for every podcast, you should look forward to F the Ineffable. If you are a diligent listener and listen through all the lessons, you will get to F the Ineffable and wordplay. 
So for F the Ineffable today, of course, we're going to talk about juncture phenomena, which we have already talked about a little bit. We have some, some old ones and some new ones to jog your memory. So we have electric versus electric, but we also have spike raft versus spy craft. Right. And this is a very good one. Of course, Tyler came up with this one. So you could have a raft full of spikes or a craft for spying. And that's spike raft or spy craft. Spike raft, spy craft. Those are different. In, in some sense, it's the same sounds in both cases, but there's special little phenomena having, having to do with how much breath is expelled on the K. I also think the vowels are different after the SP. Spike raft versus spy craft. I think it's spy, longer yeah. and more prominent in the. Good, good point. Yeah, that's also awesome. good. Classic so different letters, of course. You were more interested in the sounds involved, but there are phonetic differences. Oh, well, we uh, brought back this example: electric <laughs> versus electric. Um, somebody doesn't want to electron, apparently. So, mm -mm. <laughs> so, and we've got our our famous famous example that surely everyone has seen before: ice cream versus ice cream. You scream ice cream. We all, we scream, all scream for ice, ice cream. cream. Yeah. So that is. Uh, an exploitation of the juncture phenomenon, which native speakers know, that's why you find it delightful. <laughs> so we want you to tell us some of your favorite juncture phenomena. So whichever ones you come up with, go ahead and add us on social media. And you know, if you come up with an RT worthy juncture phenomena, look forward to it because- uh, well, Let's just mention it here real quick, langoinstitute.com, at langoinstitute.com. Uh, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram too, right? Everywhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're everywhere. We're the same name. We're even on Twitch as of this week. Coming soon. All right, so a little bit of wordplay. Um, a quote first from Calvin and Hobbes that verbing weirds languages, right? You can make stuff into verbs and that's kind of fun. And it's an example of it because weird isn't typically thought of as a verb. And there, uh, Calvin and Hobbes has changed weird to a verb, verbing weird's language. So, uh, Tyler, you maybe want to read the next one if you'll click that, Lisa. Oh, you guys like wise guys? Click again. I like wise guys like wise guys. <laughs> There's no context for you guys like wise guys. I like wise guys. Likewise, guys, it's just a, it's a just Tylerism. <laughs> uh, it has come down. Uh, it is the sweet manna that's provided for puns, and we love it. So, mm -hmm. belongs same, on this page. Same, same string of three morphemes, but grouped together in different words mm -hmm. and phrases. Right. So, a little bit of our juncture phenomena and a little bit of tongue twister all tied in, and very clever uh, resequencing of some of the same roots. So, uh, we couldn't resist sharing it. Now we're gonna, we have a little bit of time left for some allegations. Now, <laughs> if you are not watching this podcast, you should know we are not spelling allegations the way you think. We're spelling it as if it comes from alligator. So the question is, do alligators alligate? Now, uh, mostly Tyler, but we have come up with a list <laughs> of words for our alligator game. And of course, if you think of things that need to be alligated, then you should let us know. Uh, we got then, five slides of these, but we had to cut. <laughs> so there's tons of material here in English. The later allegations. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, I guess I'll read a couple and then you guys can read a couple and We'll okay. kind of split it up. I'll do this first slide and you, Lisa can do the next slide, I guess. Sounds so good. So our first, I'll read the first slide. It starts off with, does a spider spide? Does a blubber blub? Does a ledger ledge? Does a ladder lad? Does a butter butt? Does a gopher gof? Does a beaver beave? I argue yes. Does an utter ud? <laughs> 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 so good. Does a chancellor chancel of that? Does a figure fig? Does a number numb? Does a misnomer misnome? <laughs> Does a seller sell? Does a finger fing? Does a ginger ginge? Does leather leth? 
on misnomer or misnome, it makes me think of Chomsky because I misnome. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> nice. So you're a misnomer. <laughs> yeah, misnomer spelled differently. <laughs> Do scissors sizz? Does a philosopher philosoph? <laughs> Does a meter meet? Does a tuber tube? If you're a YouTuber, you use. YouTube, I suppose. Does a visor vise? Does a shower shower? <laughs> Does power pow? Puts the pow in power. Does a Peter Pete? As an answer? Well? Yes. <laughs> That's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Peters do. <laughs> so last slide here. Uh, is our outro material. Uh, of course, you should check out the LangoPod uh, now on YouTube and not forthcoming, but forthcoming mm -hmm. on iTunes. Um, read more about podcast topics on our blog. And we're even maybe going to go through and add some extra supporting blogs to some of our earlier topics too. Yeah, we did that with syllable structure and we spotlighted a couple more languages that we specialize in at Lango. And uh, as far as the feedback so far from students, they really liked it, really found it useful. So maybe we'll pick out some more topics and talk about the languages we teach. And uh, LSA annual meeting, the uh, Linguistic Society of America has their annual meeting virtual this year uh, in January, I believe January 6th. And Lango will be having a, will be sponsoring and we'll be hosting an AMA and Ask Me Anything in our own virtual room. So if you're attending or if you uh, want to attend, there's still time to register, please join and come talk to us. It's the 6th of January? I believe so. It's that Thursday. Thursday. That was the first uh, week of January. It's usually in a very cold destination. Um, so this year That's we have true. the luxury of being warm in our home offices. Uh, yeah, it looks like the virtual meeting is 7th to 10th, 20, the 7th to the 10th and 2021. 20, so maybe the kickoff is the 7th. Yeah, kickoff should be the 6th. And then there's a bunch of other meetings too the following week. So they spread it out. So please join for that. Our spring session is coming up. It starts January 11th to March 14th, we're already having people enroll and there's still time to save 10% on all your language programs before the end of the month. Um, we're continuing online lessons as well as on, on site and blended options. Conversation hours will also continue virtually as well as IGTV live sessions. I thought that went really well, Peter hosted one. Um, we've got one coming up next week about the words of the year, hot topic all these new words that have come into English thanks to COVID, which was the uh, American Dialect Society choice for uh, nominated choice for word of the year. Um, and linguistics for language learning workshops will continue those as well. And any questions or comments, please get at Peter or at us in general on social. I have a question. I have an answer. What is what is a cellar taste like? <laughs> A cellar tastes like, it's a wine joke? Celery. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, Yum. Uh, that was too good. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I do too. All right, got to end on a pun. Hmm? I think that's it for us today. So um, we will see all you Lango knots next time. Uh, until then, maybe set your phrases to stun. <laughs> 네, 안녕히 계세요. 안녕히 계세요. Speak soon. <laughs>